Hi, Pastor Scott, Pastor of the Oasis Church. Listen, we are so glad you've decided to join in and listen to what God has placed upon our hearts. We pray this will be a great resource for you, but it won't take the place of your local church. We encourage you that if you're not a part of a local body, that you get involved as quickly as possible. We pray that this will stir your affections towards Christ. Enjoy. Amen. I was going 30 miles an hour when I hit the ground. Good morning. My buddy and I had gotten these cycles, and we were taking them out as our sophomore year of high school, and my friend Michael had just gotten a speedometer for his bike. And so we were way into cross country, and we were cross training. We were in the off scene, and he said, hey, bro, I've got this speedometer. Let's go see how fast we can get these cycles up to speed. And so we went on one of these biking trails in Louisiana, and we just like, it was this paved road, and we just went. And we started pumping. I mean, just absolutely getting after it. And I remember he was like, 25, 27, 30. And right as he said 30, one of those little reflectors that's in the road, you know, the ones that like let you, you know, they're all bright. I don't know why they would have this on a bike show. Who is shining a bike at a reflector on a bike show in the middle of the road? I don't know, but my tire hit that. My wheel went sideways, and now I'm suspended in air 30 miles an hour over the pavement. Came down, my wrist rolled, skidded, popped up, and just kept running. Ow, 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 ow. Like, it was rough. So rough. Later that day, I've got my broken bike, my broken ego, and just road rash. And I'm sitting in my buddy's house, and I say, man, my wrist really hurts. It's just getting worse and worse. And the longer I sat there, I looked down, my arm's just getting more and more swollen. He's like, bro, I think you got to go to the doctor. I'm like, fine, I'll go to the doctor. I had a broken wrist. Terrible. They put me, my sophomore year, summer of my sophomore year, into a cast, and I sat in that cast for six weeks. Oh my God. And that cast began to itch and annoy me, and I hated it. I'm like, I don't like this thing. I want it off of me. I want the, I want the itch gone. I want the cast gone. And so I go into the doctor's appointment. They take the cast off. They look at it. They x-ray it. And the doctor says, son, we're putting another cast on. You're not done yet. So mad. So mad. I get home. My buddy Michael comes over, hanging out. And when he walks into my room, he finds me on my bed with a butter knife. Oh, wow. Scraping away at this cast. I said, I'm done with it. <laughs> Don't want anything to do with this cast. I'm tired of the itch. I'm tired of the inconvenience. I'm tired of being shaped and molded. I, I, I need it gone. My arm felt fine when he took it off. I know bad. Let me get this thing off. Scraping, scraping. I got all the way up to my thumb. I just couldn't get the angle right. I could not get the rest of this cast off. So I said, Michael, I need your help. Take this knife. Apply the pressure right here. You've got to help set me free. So Michael starts hacking away at my cast, and all of a sudden the knife slips, and Michael doesn't say anything but just kind of walks away. I'm like, bro, you're not done yet. And he turns around, his hands are full of blood. And he just he lets his hands go and just like gobs of blood just fall to the floor. I'm like, Michael, what's wrong? And, and his thumb is like, Almost just barely even a tag. I'm like, oh my gosh, we cut off Michael's thumb. This is not good. And so Michael's like, should we tell someone? I'm like, yes, we gotta tell someone. And so like, so now my dad's in the room. He's like, you're an idiot. Like, what are you doing, son? We get Michael to the hospital. Now Michael's got stitches and is in a cast with me for the rest of the time. And so, why did I tell you that story this morning? Because we are gonna be tempted in our Christian walk to not want to feel the itch, to feel the healing work of God's word on our lives. So we're going to try and shy away from God's work because it's uncomfortable. When God goes after a heart that is broken, sinful, in need of repairing, it is always going to come into tension with your desire to not feel discomfort. And what we're going to learn today out of 2 Timothy chapter 4, if you've got your Bibles, get to 2 Timothy chapter 4, is that when we gather, when we come to this place, God is trying to do something very specific to your heart through the preaching of his word. And the temptation that we're all going to experience in this life is to not endure sound teaching, but to be drawn away by the things that tickle, itch our ears. There's going to be things that draw you away from the Lord because they sound really good to you. Here's what I want to do this morning. We're in the middle of vision month at our church, 
And what you get is us preaching our journals. We've been praying, asking the Lord to help give us just a direction for 2021. And last week we talked uh, for a long time about what it meant to raise godly children, to cultivate them up in the faith. And that today I want to give you a solid understanding of what we do on Sunday morning. When you sit underneath the teaching and preaching of God's word, what is God trying to do to your heart? What was the problem with my sophomore self? I didn't realize that the doctor could see things I couldn't see, that the doctor had knowledge I didn't have, that the doctor knew that there was a way to heal my arm that had to follow a very specific process. And it was my arrogance, my youth, my, my lack of knowledge, my lack of submission to the healing properties of that cast that resulted in me being in a cast longer. And it got my friend pretty hurt. The same thing is true in the Christian walk. When we do not submit ourselves to God's teaching, when we don't say, Lord, you shape me. You're not an add-on to my life. Rather, I want you to be the thing that shapes all of my life. Amen. When we don't do that, not only do we hurt ourselves, but we are 99 out of 100 times going to hurt someone walking with us as well. It's a community endeavor. So what are we doing? We're going to talk about three things today. The first is this. What in the world is my pastor doing when he stands up and he starts preaching God's word? What is happening in this space and how should you be thinking about that space? The second is we got to talk about how our flesh doesn't want to conform to the word of God. That when you sit down and you hear a sermon, when you hear God's word preached faithfully, your flesh is going to say, mm-mm, 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 don't like it. But the spirit God's put inside of you is going to say, come on, that's exactly what you need. That's exactly what you need. Pressing closer, pressing closer, learn, submit, repent. And finally, I want to give you guys just an encouragement about what you need in your life to grow in godliness as we move into 2021 and as you just follow Jesus for the rest of your lives. You are going to need godly teachers in your life. You're going to need them. So let's do this. We're going to pray then we're going to read 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 1 through 5, and then we're going to study God's word. Would you pray with me? Father, we love you. We love you because you're good. We love you because you are the Almighty, you are our creator. Lord, you sent your son. He died on a cross to pay for our sins. And Lord, you've called us into a kingdom, which means you are the king. And we ask you, Lord, this morning to cultivate our hearts, soften our hearts, to shape us into the image of your son. Lord, our natural disposition is not to obey you. Our natural disposition is not to hear you. Our natural disposition is to long for the things that we think will fulfill us. God, would you tear down those walls today? Would you soften our hearts so that we can receive your word? In Jesus' my name we pray. Amen. Amen. We're going to read a passage out of 2 Timothy chapter 4. This is one of the pastoral epistles, which is a name we kind of give it because Paul is writing to Timothy and saying, this is how you ought to be pastoring the churches that are underneath you. And so there's all sorts of amazing stuff in 2 Timothy that's very encouraging for, say, like your pastors. They read this and go, oh, that's how Paul was telling Timothy to do it, right? But here's the thing. When you read the pastoral epistles, you shouldn't be like, oh, that's just for pastors. This is just their instruction handbook. Because Paul says what? In Corinthians, he says, imitate me as I imitate Christ. And so everything that you see Scott and I do from the pulpit is meant to be an example for you. This is how you ought to teach. This is how you ought to think. This is how you ought to read the Bible. These are the things you want to be looking for. And so when you read First and Second Timothy, don't say, oh, I'm never going to be an elder in my church. I'm never going to be a pastor. I'm never going to be a deacon. I'm never going to be that guy. Wrong. God wants you to imitate your leaders. So you have to be able to evaluate Do I have a pastor worth his salt who takes the Bible seriously? Do I have someone who's deep in the word, who's becoming more and more um, just growing in their ability to lead and shepherd and pastor? Are they conforming themselves to Christ? And is their life and their words an example that I can follow? So you've got to be able to evaluate what you're hearing. You've got to be able to evaluate what you see. 2 Timothy is a good book for that. How do you know you have a pastor that's worth listening to? 2 Timothy is going to give you the criteria. It's going to show you what a good pastor who's preaching the Bible looks like, sounds like, and is focused on. So that's really important for you guys, right? Because you guys got to be able to come into me and Scott's office and say, hey, hey, I heard you say this in the scriptures. I'm not sure if that's what they were actually saying. Can we have a conversation? Can we actually 
iron sharp and iron here. I want to make sure that you are in the word. That's something that we absolutely love. Anytime someone comes in and says, Pastor, are you faithfully teaching the word? That's a challenge we want. Because what does it do? It challenges us to make sure we are big in the word. Amen. Being in the faith. That's, that's how you and I work together. Now check this out. Let's read. We're in chapter four. Paul has already told Timothy that he has commissioned him to be a pastor. It says that he called him in front of a bunch of faithful men, said, I taught you all this stuff. I want you to go teach these things to others. And what are you going to teach them? He says, I want you to rightly divide the word of truth. That's in chapter two. In chapter three, he says, what is the word of truth? All scripture is breathed out by God. And he says, this is what you are to teach. You're to teach the scriptures. And then we get chapter four, and he's going to use that repetition. When you read the Bible, look for repetition. He's going to do this over and over and over. He says, I charge you, Timothy, in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead, and by his appearing in his kingdom. All right, so he says, there's the authority. I am literally saying, in God's name, this is your job. This is what you are to do. What is Timothy to do? Verse two, preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, and exhort with complete patience and teaching. For the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching. But having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions. And they will turn away from listening to the truth and will wander off into myths. As for you, always be sober-minded. Endure suffering. Do the work of an evangelist. Fulfill your ministry. What is Timothy called to do? He says, you are called to preach the word. Preach the word. Preach is to proclaim, to expound, to explain. This is what God has said. He doesn't say, Timothy, your job is to inspire them with some good philosophy. Timothy, your job is to get up and make them really love you through some really cool personal stories about falling off your bike. That's not the point. It's not the point. Your job is to preach the word. Amen. Your job is to show them what God has revealed in his scriptures. That is Timothy's primary purpose as a pastor. Preach the word. What is the word? Paul has already defined it in this book. Look at 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. These are the two verses right before this passage. He says, all scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. What is Timothy's goal? when he preaches to his congregations. He wants them to be equipped for every single good work. In fact, he says, look, I want you to teach, reprove, correct, train them in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete. If you do not have the word of God in your life, you are not walking in completeness. Amen. If you're not coming underneath the word of God, you're not following the gospel. You're following the flesh. And he says, Timothy, your job is to get them the word because it's the word that shapes them. It is the word that teaches them. It is the word that makes them complete, that trains them in righteousness. It is a sufficient word that Timothy is going to preach. What does he have to do with this word? 2 Timothy 2.15 he says, but avoid irreverent babble for it will lead people into more and more ungodliness and their talk will spread like gangrene among them. Rightly divide the word of truth. We must rightly divide the word of truth. Do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a worker who has no need to be ashamed, rightly handling the word of truth. When a pastor preaches, he can rightly handle God's word 
or he can what? Wrongly handle God's word. This is really important because we live in a day and age where we compare opinions and we're not interested in opinions when we're talking about God's word. Amen. God says there's a right way to handle it. There's a wrong way to handle it. How do we know it's the right way? How do we know that the Bible, how do we know that the pastor is preaching the word of God? How do you know it? Well, Paul says this when he calls Timothy. He says in chapter two, he says, then you, my child, be strengthened by the grace that is in Christ Jesus, that what you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses entrust to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. The teachings of scripture did not start yesterday. The teachings of Scripture did not start 100 years ago. The teachings of Scripture have been going on ever since God first started revealing himself to man in spoken word. Amen. Wow. It means we need the church and we need the teachers that God has given us in the church who have been taught by Paul. And then Paul taught, taught Timothy. And then Timothy's disciples taught guys like John Martyr and Polycarp, and Tertullian, and Origen, and Athanasius, and Augustine. Who are all these men who have been wrestling with Scripture for the last 2,000 years, who have said, we're reading the sentences. God has spoken in a way that mankind can understand and discern and disseminate. And we have, as a church, collectively, for the last 2,000 years, been ironing out what is good doctrine. Amen. And guess what? We have very, very firm foundations on what good doctrine is in the church. This is why in Ephesians chapter 4 it says, I have given them the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, and the teachers so that they might be equipped for the work of ministry. God has given us his word. He's given us his Holy Spirit. And he has given the church teachers who have been ironing out and wrestling with God's word for thousands of years. And we have landed very solidly on what this Bible teaches. Sufficiently so that we can say with pure confidence, this is how you get saved. This is what salvation is. We know that Jesus is the second person in the Trinity, the Son of God, and that through him, he's the only way to get to the Father. Amen. It's not one way, it's the only way. We can foundationally, firmly say those things about God. We know how to rightly divide the word of truth. And so you need a pastor who's going to preach God's word, that he's going to draw from God's word the truth. So Timothy's supposed to preach the word. What is my pastor doing up here? He's preaching the word. He's trying to give you training in righteousness. He's going to try and rebuke, reprove, exhort. And let's talk about those words. What does it mean when it says reprove? Reprove is a correction. It means I'm changing course. I'm going to help you go from left to right. I'm going to help you be from wrong and into right. I want to help you walk better with Jesus. Amen. Now, reprove is a cool word because reprove is like a gentle correction. It's spoken softly. It's given with compassion. It's saying, hey, this isn't right. It's not quite right. Let's just adjust a little bit. Come back this way. It's funny. Like I see this with my toddler all the time. He takes Grant's toy and I say, hold on, Tucker, come here. That wasn't right. Let me reprove you. Let me show you what is right. Give the toy back. We share. That's what you're supposed to do. You're supposed to share, son. A reprove is something that is compassionately given. It's a small shift in the direction. You're just a little off north. Let's get you back north. But what is a rebuke? A rebuke is a harsh correction. Yep. It's like when my toddler runs into the street and I go, Tucker, stop. And he goes, why am I harsh when my son's running towards the road? Because it's his life that's at stake. If you don't realize that you're in a spiritual war, that we are not contending with flesh and blood, that the enemy wants you spiritually dead and separated from God, then you cannot appreciate when a pastor says, stop it, don't go there, don't do it. The Bible's so clear, that is not good for you. And so we reprove, we say, hey guys, this is how we walk better with Jesus, this is how we walk better with Jesus, and we rebuke, we say, stop, 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 stop. That's danger. That's off limits. Don't go there. You have to have a pastor who's willing to rebuke from the pulpit. That's right. 
because that's what's going to help you. It doesn't do me any good to reprove my son gently as a car careens down the street. That's not love. That's not being a good dad. I want a dad who runs out, grabs his kid and says, don't do that. Don't do it. I love you too much to let you run into the street. I love you too much to avoid hard passages of scripture that tell you exactly where the pit lies. Amen. You have to teach and rebuke and reprove. And you get to exhort. Exhort is encouragement. It's a call to rise up. It says, look, don't go here. Really don't go there. Follow me. Let's go here. Let's go here. I was running the half mile in high school. That was my race. It was an absolutely torturous race. And I remember I would be running that last 100 yards and my coach had this thing where he would like use really flowery language at me in the last 100 yards while running next to me. You know, and I can't really say what he said, but he was saying, let's go, let's go. You got 100 yards. Come on, come on, come on. Let's go, let's get it. Let's go. Part of preaching is, I just want to tell you guys, we got to go take the gospel out there. Amen. Let's go. God has called us up and above, and he wants you to know him, and he wants you to be more like Jesus, and through the power of his Holy Spirit, he's going to shape you, call you into repentance, and he's going to say, let's go. Let's get after it. Let's follow Jesus. It's amazing what people will do when they are encouraged to do it. Man, I was a youth pastor for several years, and one of my favorite illustrations is when I would take a kid, and I'd say, I want you to hold this chair over your head for as long as you can. And they'd stand in front of the, you know, their peers, and they'd hold that chair up there, and we'd just set a timer. 20, 30 seconds, they'd come down. Good job. Now I want you to do it again. And I would tell the whole crowd, I want you to cheer for this person. Get loud. Come on. Everyone get really loud. And all the kids would be like, oh, you can do it. It's awesome. I kid you not, that kid would usually like quadruple their time. Yep. You're from like 30 seconds to like two minutes, we're like, ah, <laughs> like, I got this. <laughs> we need exhortation. We need to be encouraged. We also need rebuke. We need reproof. Yep. Our flesh doesn't want reproof or rebuke. Nope. It doesn't. And that is something that we have to meditate on this morning. Verse 3 says, for the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching. Before we even go there, you don't want to run past this. How is Timothy supposed to reprove, rebuke, and exhort? With complete patience. Complete patience and teaching. And actually, what you want to do is you want to take that word complete and apply it to both. It's complete patience and complete teaching. So I'm not patient and give you partial teaching. I give you complete teaching and I have complete patience as you get the complete teaching. Does that make sense? You don't want a watered down gospel and call that patience. They'll get the rest in the next 52 weeks. No, you want what the Bible says today. And you may not understand it today the way a toddler doesn't fully understand the commands he's being given, but you're being shaped. And the pastor, like a good parent, should be patient walking alongside you. Be wary of a pastor who is abusive with his language and has no patience for his congregation. Yep. That's not a good pastor. Your pastor should be willing to meet with you. Your pastor should be willing to counsel you. Your pastor should be willing to answer your questions. Your, pa your pastor should be willing to show you answers. It's not his authority. If he says, I have the answer, you should not question me. That's a bad pastor. Right. A pastor say, come sit down. I'll show you the Bible. And I'll show you all the verses that show why I taught what I taught. And why this holds to the testimony of the saints for the last 2,000 years. This is true for a reason. And we didn't come and arrive at this idea yesterday. It's grounded in the text. Here it is. A good pastor should invite people into his office to have conversations about the Bible. Amen. If you have a question in your life, say, Pastor, I, I heard what you said. I'm not sure how this applies in my life specifically. Then you say, here's my life. Here's a specific situation. Can you help me look at the word so I can completely be taught? And will you show complete patience? Even though I don't understand. That's a good pastor. That's the sort of pastor you want. One who is willing to sit down with you and go verse by verse. Who's not content to say, it was my opinion. You should just obey me. Because you shouldn't. You should come underneath the teaching of the word. But our flesh doesn't want God's word. 
And this is the other side of the coin. You and I are in a spiritual battle. Romans chapter 7 says we want to do the right thing, but evil lies close at hand. That the war of the spirit is that we are at war with the flesh within us. And we need to put to death the flesh. So here is our warning. Here is the uh, reproof this morning. You are going to sit in sermons and disagree with your pastor, and that's a good thing. You want to be put in tension with your own mind. You want the Bible to come into tension with where you're at today because it's drawing you towards Christ. If a faithful pastor is preaching the word and you're saying, I don't know if I agree, before you say you're right, you might need to ask the question, is this my flesh trying to keep me from repentance? Is this my flesh trying to keep me from hearing what I need to hear so that I can get free of this sin? Is this the flesh trying to keep me from learning so that I won't glorify God at work in my family, with my children, with my spouse? Is it possible that you're the child in the equation and you need instruction? The answer, of course, is yes. We all need the instruction of the Lord. And so when we come to church and we sit down and we engage in the preaching and teaching of God's word, our posture should be that of one of the student. Teach me. I'm not prepared to teach the class. I need to learn. I need to absorb. I need to listen to God's word so that I can be trained in righteousness. I need to be changed. I need my heart shifted. Our flesh doesn't want God's word. What does it say? It says, for the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching, but having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions. Look at that. I want you to circle, will not endure sound teaching. It is easy to come to a church once a week and kind of sit through teaching. Enduring sound teaching is when that teaching is put into action. It's easy for us all to say, yes, we ought to talk about Jesus at work. But what happens when the teaching itself calls us to action and we go and our boss calls us in and says, hey, look, you talk about Jesus at the water cooler one more time and we're going to have to reprimand you with HR. Maybe I don't want to endure that teaching quite so much. Pastor, maybe we're not supposed to say the gospel at all. Maybe we're just supposed to live lives that look really good and use words when necessary. That's not what the Bible teaches. But doesn't that sound good? Look great, don't say a word. You certainly will advance your career faster that way. You'll make it through school without a hitch. You'll get a good job. You will not be a problem to the world if you just look like Gandhi and don't talk about Jesus. It's a problem. We don't like being put in tension with the world. That's part of our flesh. We want to be liked. That's a human characteristic. I want friends. I want to be liked. I want people to like me. I don't want to be in tension with the world. But when I come into God's word, he is putting me at tension with the world because I've got a sin problem. I've got a sin nature, and he's after my sin nature. So what do I do? I'm not going to endure the sound teaching. I'm going to say I reject the teaching because it is too hard. It calls me to change too much. It calls me into tension with the sin that's in my heart too much. That's why I can't endure it. I'm trying to get away from being shaped into Christ, and I'm trying to get Christ to be more like me. You tracking with that? (laughs) Now look at this. What do they do then? It says, for the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching, but having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions. Look at this. The time is coming when people will not endure. Paul is very, very specific when he teaches about who is in the faith and who is out of the faith. The language he uses, these are not believers. An unbeliever will come to church, will receive God's word, and there will not be tension there. There will be absolute offense. How dare God tell me to change my life? How dare God call me to be a different person? How dare him? How can he say my buddy at work isn't going to get into heaven if he doesn't have Christ? How could he possibly say that? That's not a good God. That's a bad God. I reject God. The unbeliever will reject God's word. And the believer will struggle with God's word because God's word is contending for your heart. I like to quote this verse every time I get up here. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12 says, The word of God is living and active. It's a double-edged sword. Pierces down through bone and marrow to what? The intent of the heart. The sooner we can wrap our minds around the fact that our hearts are not in our best interest, 
that our hearts are literally being redeemed out of sin. That before you had Christ, you had a dead heart. And now that you have Christ, your heart is sensitive to the word of God, but it is still plagued with sin. Amen. Jeremiah 17 says, your heart is evil and wicked. Who knows how bad it really is? It says, but the Lord weighs the heart. And so every time I sit down and I hear the word of God, I'm asking the Lord to offend me. Offend the spirit, the flesh, that would try and lead me away from obedience to your son. Amen. Make that smaller. Make the flesh smaller and your son magnified in my life. Make my heart sensitive to the words of God, not to the words of man. Make my heart obedient to the word of God that I might experience the joy and the promise of your faithfulness. Amen. Lord, you have your way with me through your word, but offend me so that I will move away from sin and towards the cross. That's a good thing. The unbeliever will be offended. The believer is going to struggle. So here is the warning. But having itching ears, these people who will not endure sound teaching, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions. Their own passions. You know what's amazing about this passage is you could really journal over this and ask yourself this question, what are my passions? What are the things that get me up and going in the morning? What are the things I care a lot about? List them out. What are the things that you put on that to-do list that are just like, this is primary for me. If I could do this all day, every day, if this is what I was about, this is what it would be. And then ask yourself this question, does God have an opinion in that area of your life? Is God shaping that passion? Because what this is saying is this, God came into contact with their passion and basically said, your passion's in the wrong place. And they said, well, I've got to make my passion fit with the Bible. So if my passion's not going to change, what am I going to change? I'm going to change the word of God to fit my passion. But here's the problem. If you stand up and say, hey, I've got my opinions, um, and I don't think the Bible agrees with those, there's not a whole lot of authority there, is there? It's a lot easier to go find a guy who calls himself a pastor and say, well, Bob down the street says I'm right. So I'm going to keep doing what the word says I ought not to be doing because Bob is lying to the church. False teachers exist. Yep, yes. It's one of the things the early church wrote about a lot. In fact, John said this, that the spirit of the Antichrist is now at work, has already gone out, that there are those who are actively trying to pull you away from the faith by false teaching. False teachers are a real problem. Look at Galatians chapter 1. This is cool. One of the things I love about Paul is that he has written so extensively about, and in Galatians, his opening comment to the church was this. It says, Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins, to deliver us from this present evil age, according to the will of our God and Father, to whom be the glory forever and ever. Amen. He says, God is pulling us out of darkness. This age is an evil one. It's not a good one. The disposition of man is bad, not good. But look at verse 6. I am astonished that you are so quickly deserting him who called you in the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel. Not that there is another one, but there are some who trouble you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. False teachers distort the gospel of Christ. They are going to take the good news of Jesus, his resurrection from the dead, your payment of sin given to you so you have eternal life relation with the Father, and they're going to add something onto that. They're going to say your redemption into the kingdom of God is not the main event. That was the starting line of the main event. The real main event is now you're going to be really, really blessed. You're going to get a lot of of stuff. In fact, God, because of what he did for Christ, shows how much he loves you, and parents who love their kids spoil them, and so you're going to get a lot of stuff if you'll dedicate yourself to Christ. The point of Christ was not your salvation. It's for your blessing. You're going to hear, in fact, man, if there's one word I wish we could redefine in the church today, it's this word blessing. We use it flippantly, as if the blessing of eternal life with the Father is somehow diminished if I don't get the right house. That's weird, isn't it? Yes. Yes. 
every spiritual blessing at our disposal. That's what Ephesians says, that we have eternal life paid and bought for. The blood of Christ covers you. You're going to stand in front of God one day and he's going to smile at you and say, you are mine. I purchased you. Come on in. Every sin wiped clean. And I don't think we're going to stand there and say, but Lord, you didn't bless me enough. (laughs) I was looking for the Maserati Christianity, not the eternal life kind. That doesn't make sense. That's a distortion of the gospel. The gospel is about your salvation from sin, so you might be in relationship with the Father. There's nothing greater you could ever possibly want. And if you think there is, that's idolatry. Let me rebuke you. That's dangerous. Really, really, really dangerous. Beware of a gospel that takes the redemption of your soul and then says, but God's got something else for you too. What else could he give me that could possibly trump that? Nothing. False teachers distort the gospel. And the distortion is not always easy to recognize. We use the same language. In fact, if I were to uh, say, hey, will you hold my watch? And I then handed you a pair of binoculars. <laughs> You'd say, Seth, that's not a watch. I'm like, no, 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 you watch through them. Same word. It's what a lot of false religions that use Christianity as an umbrella like to do. Yep. We worship Jesus. You worship Jesus? We worship Jesus. Oh, really? That's great. The second person in the Trinity. No, not the second person in the Trinity. The one true God? No, not the one true God. Well, then, wait, why did you call yourself a Christian? You're not a Christian. That's a false religion. You're a false teacher. You've distorted the gospel, and you've actually distorted doctrines that have been established through the church. That's not true. Church, I strongly encourage you, if you have not done this, go to our website and read what we teach at this church. If you haven't done that, you're not holding me and Scott to account. It should not take but a click to get on a church's website to find out what they believe and what they teach. I will never understand why churches hide their teaching. It's not healthy. It's not a good thing. Why? Because they're saying, we don't want you to see what's behind the curtain. But that's not what the Bible says. says, You've got to teach them the word. Show them what you're going to teach. Be very clear about what the gospel is. Be very clear about what sound doctrine is in your church. I used to take college kids in our college group, and I'd hand them three doctrinal statements. I was like, here are two Christian churches, and here's the Mormon church. Which church are you going to choose? And I wouldn't tell them which ones they were. Half our college team would join the Mormon church. Why? Because they had never been challenged to disseminate good doctrine from bad doctrine. And so they couldn't see that when the Mormon church said, uh, we believe that Christ is one in purpose with the Father, but is not one with the Father. They didn't realize that was a heresy, that they were actually saying they weren't Christians. They were going to call them to a false gospel because they just distorted the message a little bit. You have got to be diligent. Be diligent with us. That's a challenge today. That would be a good application. Go check out our About page. We've put what we teach on our website. It's important to us. We think that's something a church should be transparent about. Heretical teaching is almost always biblical. You say, wait, what? What does that mean? What I mean is every good heretic has got a Bible verse to show why they're right, which means we've got to be able to know the word better than false teachers. Church, I just want to warn you. We live in a day and age where people are doing what is right in their own eyes, and we are not any less susceptible to that sin. It says in chapter 4, but having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions. May I suggest, if you are not following a false teacher and yet you are resisting the teaching of the church, that you might be the guy you're listening to the most. That the person itching your ears is yourself. I want to challenge you. When you read the Bible, does God agree with you or disagree with you more often than not? Who's right nine out of ten times when you come to a hard passage? You or the Lord? Who's making the concessions in your life? God or you? When your pastor says, hey, I want to call you higher. I want to encourage you to go out. Do you have a bunch of good reasons why that doesn't apply to you? This would be a reproof, right? I'm not hitting you over the head too hard. Beware being the person who's tickling your own ears. 
find a pastor, find a church. That's what we believe our church is, a church that is grounded in the word of truth. But you've got to hold us accountable. Amen. One of my favorite passages in Acts is when the Bereans hold Paul to account. He says, here's the gospel. Here's what God has revealed. And they say, hold up, go get the scrolls. We're checking that. We're not just taking you at your word, Paul. We want to know what God has revealed. But Paul was shown to be true. And they said, all right, we're in. If God says it, we're in. And that should be the call of the church. If God says it, we're in. Last point, you need godly teachers. We all do. There's three questions you need to be asking about your life. Who's discipling me? Who am I discipling? How am I serving God's church? God is the one who set up pastors in his church. So don't be deceived. If someone says all you need is the Bible, that's not what the Bible says. The Bible says this is all the truth you need. But we need teachers. We need them. Ephesians 4 says that God has specifically given us them for our good, that they're going to help us be equipped to be trained in righteousness, to do the work of ministry. You need the pastorate, and the pastorate needs the accountability of the congregation. It's very, very important. You need godly teachers. I want to encourage you this morning. Who in your life have you given permission to reprove you? Who in your life is able to rebuke you? I mean, a harsh, good, harsh rebuke. Slap on the wrist. Don't go there. God doesn't want that for your marriage. Doesn't want that for your kids. Doesn't want that for your faith. Who is there in your life who's able to actually help correct you towards Christ? At least once a week when we gather in this place, Pastor Scott, myself, the teachers who stand in this podium are there for your good. And so every week when Scott gets up to preach, something that I'm praying in the back for myself is, Lord, use Scott to shape my heart. As one of the pastors on staff, I don't get to dodge that and be like, well, I'm one of the pastors, so I'm, I'm the authority now. Here we go. That's not it. It's not at all. So you know what we do as pastors? We make sure that we're reading who has come before us. You should do this too. 2,000 years. Guess what? The Holy Spirit didn't wake up yesterday and say, let's make some Christians. Really good godly men have come before us, and they wrote stuff down. They said, this is what God is showing us in the Word. And then they contended with one another. You should know who has come before you, and you should find out what they think about the Bible. It's important. Why is it important? Because God has given the church teachers, and those teachers span more than the last 50 years. I just want to encourage you so much. If you've never read some of the Reformers, if you've never read Augustine, if you've never looked back and said, who were the guys that the apostles taught? Did they write stuff? Yeah, they did. You want to know how much they wrote? This amazed me. It's a little fun fact, a little trivia for you. You can take the letters, just the letters of men and women quoting the Bible in the early church, not copying the Bible, not transcribing the Bible, writing letters back and forth, talking about Jesus. And you can reconstruct the New Testament four times with their quotes. Polycarp, what do you think Revelation, what do you think this is talking about? And they're quoting the Bible to each other. We can reconstruct their conversations. We can reconstruct the New Testament four times. That's on top of the 5,700 copies and fragments of the New Testament we have. It's amazing. There are people that we need to contend with who have already died and are in glory, who thought really, really well about the church. As your pastors, part of our mission is to make sure we're learning and that we are, like it says, look at this, it says, be ready in season and out of season. What does that mean? It means your pastor's got to be ready to give a response for the hope that he has in him at a drop of a hat. If I'm standing on the street corner and someone says, preach, go, I I know what I'm going to say. I know exactly how to present the gospel. And guess what? Our job is to teach you to do the same. And so here's the thing. I want Scott's schedule so busy with you guys going into his office saying, will you teach us? Teach us the gospel. How did you preach? How did you discover that in the text? How do you find out what you're discovering? I, I, I didn't see what you saw. Can you show me how you got there? We want that accountability, and you want that training. We don't charge that stuff. It's free. Come and get it. The Lord has given the pastors to the church. It's not like a gym where you got to go get those private sessions, right? Like, you call us up. We're like, yes, Bible, let's go. That's what we do. I want to encourage you, church. Look at this. What is my pastor doing? He's trying to be a Christian who's faithfully teaching the Word of God. You and I, this isn't my position most of the time. We have to sit 
in submission to the word of God. Let me give you the gospel. Jesus, when he rose from the grave, purchased your salvation. Amazing. We have offended God. We have done everything. We deserve wrath, hellfire, destruction, and yet God sent his son so that you and I might gather and say, let's get after Jesus. And he does that for us through his word, through your personal time in the word, but he also does it right here, the preaching and teaching of God's word. Let's pray.